this is Michael Astor from Ability Fierce, and today we have a very special guest, Shahana Anif, who's running for City Council in District 39. Shahana has lupus, and she has a strong platform about disabilities, and she's going to talk to us about what she, as a disabled person, feels about the system and how she hopes she can change it within the City Council. Hi, Shahana. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. It's so nice to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm really excited to, to chat some more about having lupus and be on your show, Ability Fierce, and um, thank you. So what are, what are the symptoms or what are the things that you deal with? from? So the strand of lupus I have is what's called lupus nephritis, mm -hmm. and it impacts the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So kidney disease presents itself in a variety of ways. And for me, primarily, it's, it's been, um, I have arthritic conditions all across my body, and um, my joints are in pain and were severely in pain when I was diagnosed. And what lupus is, is unique to every, everybody who is diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. So although there are some features like fatigue and uh, most of us have joint pain, mm -hmm. um, it can directly impact different organs in the body. So it is an autoimmune disease, so the body is attacking itself. Mm -hmm. um, and in some bodies, there are other organs impacted. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was in my kidneys. For some others, it's in their heart and lungs. And so this is serious, and having issues in one organ impacts the rest of the body. So over the course of the treatment process and being on medications, being hospitalized until I was stable mm -hmm. and um, you know safe to be discharged, I was immo completely immobile. And my joints were so weak and in pain that I could not walk without someone being there with me and without walking aids. So my life went from going to school with my sister, um, taking the train to now needing, uh, needing um, accommodation and needing to rely on either a parent mm -hmm. more closely than I had ever needed to. Um, and and the language to describe that pain, the language to describe, I now need paratransit services, mm -hmm. or I now need to know what my rights are as a student who will eventually return to school mm -hmm. with disabilities. Right, now that's interesting because one of the things we talk about a lot on the show is that disability is the only minority you can suddenly become part of. You can join. You know, most minorities you're born into, but disability can happen to anybody. And so you're somebody who wasn't thinking about this probably very much at all, and suddenly you're smacked in the face with how do you get accessoride? How do you get a power to help you? How do you get accommodations in school? So how was that experience? It was lonely. And early on, yeah, it was my mother and I. Mm -hmm. And she accompanied me to every single appointment after I was discharged and it was a conversation between myself and the doctor and then doing interpretation so that my mother was on the same page. Mm -hmm. My mother of course was very sensitive to everything she was hearing. Mm -hmm. and it Probably worse than you. Totally but, yeah. and so it was also considering thinking about her emotions and as a very young person that wasn't my initial like thinking so mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. I look back now I'm like my lupus impacted every single person in, in my family yes I, I think that's one of the issues that I would like to see addressed on the political level so if you do get elected um, you know families don't get leave for that's right taking that's their, right. their kids to the doctor and all the problems I mean you have you know and even if you have helpers sometimes they don't come in and your whole day is shot and uh, the Equal Employment Act doesn't protect family members it only protects the disabled people which is good that it's protecting them even though few disabled people very uh, relatively few disabled people are actually employed Absolutely. but it's a it's an impact on the whole family and I think that has to be recognized 
Um, you know, I think there have to be laws in place that, pr that I agree. recognize that. I yeah. agree. And now more clearly, mm -hmm. it it is so visible to me how crucial my mother's role was mm -hmm. in my remission. So right now I'm in remission. And mm -hmm. I get to say that because my mother was there so closely. My father would take days off and... Now I realize, I mean, their full-time, after their full-time work, mm -hmm. was their eldest daughter. And we, I have two younger sisters. Mm -hmm. So I, as a result of the lupus, underwent several replacement surgeries. And the first of them were um, my hips. And my left hip uh, was replaced in 2010. And when we received that diagnosis, mm -hmm. I mean, that was really the hardest because again, none of us had experienced any surgical procedures um, as severe as this diagnosis. And so when one of the doctors presented to me, listen, your, the x-rays I'm seeing right now mm -hmm. show that you need to get your hip replaced. And we had just wor heard the word replaced and just freaked out. We freaked out entirely. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, at this point, I'm like eight, 19 mm -hmm. years old and just did not know like what this would mean for my life because I'm thinking surgery, I'm thinking time. I'm thinking, will I need to take an entire semester off from college? Will like, will my friends support me? Like, will I have friends? I was able to, to understand I needed support and understanding support allowed me to receive the support mm -hmm. and make friendships that were built around, I'm gonna not be able to come to this event because I will not be able to make it. I'm gonna be in pain or I'm so, not blowing you off. I'm not that's right. being a bad friend. I Right. Yeah. Understanding relationships and how to how to manage relationships. Um, it strengthened my friendships with my sisters. So it really jump started something that mm. I had never lived with. And it's these feelings and it's these philosophies that that I value. Um, and it, it activated me in a way that pushed me into organizing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, let's talk about organizing. <laughs> uh, 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 what on the city council level can you actually do to help the, with? because we've, we've identified all these problems and they seem pretty easy to identify, the paratransit issues, the, the issues of parents and work and having a coordinator. What can the city council actually do? Those two are major. So the mm -hmm. family leave, mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to explore that. Mm -hmm. I would love to explore that. The onus falls on disabled people to take days off mm -hmm. for their care. Mm -hmm. But our care requires accommodation and most often accompaniment mm -hmm. with a parent. Mm -hmm. And that means two people are taking days off. Mm -hmm. So this is critical. The paratransit gap, I want to be able to close that gap. Mm -hmm. There has to be a way that people with disabilities can ride and travel across our city and not just to doctor's appointments. Mm -hmm. Paratransit is for all sorts of services um, with dignity mm -hmm. and on time. Mm -hmm. We should yeah, not be waiting big, yeah. hours um, to be picked up and to be dropped off to events that start and end uh, like- At fixed times. Right, at fixed right. times. Um, the other big issue for me is having a streamlined, what we were talking about earlier, jumping from doctor to doctor and losing medical records or not having a, a, a version that is streamlined so that every single caretaker um, in the trajectory, because most of us with disabilities and chronic conditions will live our entire lives with them. Mm -hmm. So needing to recall exactly what happened in 2009 for me or 2008 for me is now a challenge because it's 11 years later. The other is the work week. Mm -hmm. So because I'm someone who right now still sees specialists on a regular basis, it is absurd to me that I need to take a, a day off 
Right, the specialists the work needs. nine to five and everyone right. else works so nine there, to five. This, it, it does not make sense. Mm. Having a disability connects absolutely to just every realm of the city. So the housing issues, I mean, a lot of the constituent cases I deal with now, just in my day job, mm -hmm. is folks who are seniors wanting to freeze their rent so that they're able to live here. Mm -hmm. But that is hard. If residents have SSI, are receiving SSI, it limits them from cash assistance mm -hmm. uh, to help with rent. And, and so th these markers really make it difficult for people to pursue what are supposed to be benefits mm -hmm. and push some of us to work, mm -hmm. to work full-time jobs that are hard, but to, to keep and hold on to health insurance, it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm paying a lot for health insurance. Uh, and that is, it, it just is disrespectful. It's just disrespectful to me that I, out of my paycheck, mm -hmm. almost $600, $700 mm -hmm. are funneling in, are, are, are removed, deduced mm -hmm. um, from my paycheck. Mm -hmm. and, and then on top of and that- And then when you go to the doctor or the emergency room, you have a deductible. That's and, right. So I am someone who will be striving for Medicare for all. Right. And it is critical to my survival. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know if Medicare for all was something that was a reality implemented a decade ago, my experience with lupus, the diagnosis, the treatment, the healing, all of that would even, would be shaped out very differently. Mm -hmm. So I will probably be the first elected in the slate, in the 2021 slate, who will be pushing and in almost every breath and in conversation, amplifying mm -hmm. these issues that are super intersectional to the lives of people with disabilities. I think one of the things that, you know, they talk about universal design. If you make something accessible for people in wheelchairs and people with disabilities, it helps everybody. It doesn't just help the people with the wheelchairs. And as I've been working more and more on this program and with my advocacy, I see that disability and the intersectional nature of it Everything, it, it, it starts, you get into the rent issues, you get into issues of gender, you get into issues of, um, you know, the whole intimacy and touch because of caregivers. Right. You get into jobs right. issues. The home health aid opportunity mm -hmm. has helped so many immigrant women in my community mm -hmm. because it's true that many of us in, in households that are where, yeah, our parents are the de facto caretaker, mm -hmm. um, are now able to receive some funding mm -hmm. uh, for their hard labor. Mm -hmm. And care is, care needs to be intentional. So the care that people with disabilities receive should be um, from caretakers who are genuinely interested in, in providing care. Um, so I, I will be following the home health aid um, track where many, many people who are limited English proficient mm -hmm. caretakers, many people who cannot do other jobs because of their immigration status mm -hmm. or cannot do other jobs because of the skill level, mm -hmm. um, that, th that m I hope that this is much more robust um, in the coming years. So it's, it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a big challenge, but that's why I talk about, and I think we're on the same page in abilities revolution. I think we need to take a structural change. Uh, we have to look at it, stop looking at it on cost basis and that's look at right. it on service basis. Like if you judge the services, is this disabled person getting what they need to be a viable person in society? Then if you want to fiddle around with the cost behind the scenes, that's fine, but if you fail the people on the service level, then you're failing. And now what it is is, well, we just, I mean, the president of the, or the head of the OPWDD, which is the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, which is a mouthful, even OPWDD is a mouthful, said, well, he doesn't, you know, have the money. There's no money, There's, of course there's money available. You take it from somewhere else, You raise taxes on the rich or whatever right. you have to do. Right. But let's say if you're a disabled person, 
I believe health care for all, it helps us. It creates a stronger workforce. It creates a happier society, a healthier society. And if the disabled people are getting what they need to participate in society, you eliminate the stigma. You, you create understanding. You create a stronger um, society. And the caregiving jobs can be invested with dignity. And they make money. And they spend the money. Right. You know, so it, 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 it seems like if we could unknot this and change the focus to are we the most powerful nation on earth giving the people the care they deserve? That's right. Or are we trying to squeeze them, you know, yeah. and we need this change. So I hope when you're in the city council you... <laughs> I will. And this work has been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. So people with disabilities have been on the front lines mm -hmm. of pushing for the urgency of ADA accessibility, of transforming our lives so that we can live, mm -hmm. and that we can live good lives mm -hmm. um, in a society that has trapped us, mm -hmm. and, and trapped us in transit mm -hmm. access, trapped us in being able to live in apartments in our, in our own city that birthed us. Um, uh, access, uh, in access from hospital care, uh, challenges with accessing health insurance. I mean, our most basic structures are corrupt or unavailable. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'm very interested in making sure that there's a task force mm -hmm. and work very closely with the Mayor's Office of Persons with Disabilities, um, which I've already been working with. Um, to push for voting access. I mean, that has been a tremendous issue in making sure that people with disabilities can vote. You know, right, right. So that's that's an issue. But you're right. The the you know they they say a lot that it's the largest minority. If people with disabilities could be vote as a block, I think people would start paying a lot more attention. Uh, hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, totally. And so these conversations are important because. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just be an ally mm -hmm. when people with disabilities have been leading these conversations for eons mm -hmm. and we have not closed the gaps. So I want to see more people with disabilities as members of the community boards, mm -hmm. as members of the education committees and school boards, um, as members on the city council, as members across our electorate who who have disabilities and are speaking about it, or who have disabilities and may not be prioritizing some issues, but I would like to see priority. Mm -hmm. um, and the conversation has been silent, I would say, electorally, um, except for the Medicare for All push. And I'm following that deeply, that it's important to me, it's important for me as someone who has lived my entire life in, in New York City I would like to see that for New York and other states across across our across our nation, um, and for all of my siblings with disabilities across our nation. And um, it it's a tough fight. And I'm at I'm at a place where I'm able to really push for the urgency because right now my entire focus isn't with lupus. It mm -hmm. is now pushing for power. It is now pushing for. Um, the advocacy that will push people in power mm -hmm. to make sure that our needs are met with dignity. It's been critical for me to write and, and, and know other writers mm -hmm. through my journey because writing allowed me to see people are talking about it and mm -hmm. people have always been talking about disability and maybe not on my block or in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. but me writing about it created um, created an urgency in my neighborhood mm -hmm. to now start talking about it. So it, it has allowed me to see all across, really online, because my initial activism before my hip replacement surgeries, I focused and concentrated on having online support, uh, an online support system, because mm -hmm. that is where I felt safe mm -hmm. to talk about lupus. It is where I felt that I could meet other people with not just lupus, but disabilities across the spectrum thing. Mm -hmm. So we've needed to cultivate support groups and systems um, which don't exist uh, as standard within the fold of our healthcare institution um, or the fold of uh, needing 
social worker or mm. needing therapy for the the psychological journey that comes yeah, side the by side of this yeah side by sort side. of they drop this bomb on you right and then you're like i this is depression yeah and but how do we balance needing needing to make medical visits and now needing to make visits with uh, a psychologist mm -hmm. and or a social worker and so th i'm still balancing that like i have not found a sound balance um, in in making sure that my care mm -hmm. is comprehensive, even after a whole decade of now knowing just the, the loopholes in our system. Yeah, we want to move towards a holistic model where yep. there's somebody who says, hey, this is your situation, and you have this psychological component, this medical component, this work component, this benefits and system component, and can kind of put them all together. And what happens is it's it's one mother or one father who learns for their kid, and then that knowledge just ends with them. Right. And that's right. why, this is one of the that's reasons right. I do this show, is I, if I that's have right. to learn, I'm putting it out on Brooklyn Free Speech TV, which isn't a huge audience, but it's there, and you right. learn with me, instead of me just learning and keeping it for myself. Agreed. That's Agreed. you know what I'm trying to do here. Now, thank I just you. wanted to touch, thank you, you're welcome. Thank I you. wanted to touch on one other thing, is cultural uh, relations to disabilities. And do you find in, in the Bangladeshi community there's some stigma attached to disability or shame in this? Or There was certainly stigma attached to this. Mm -hmm. And my parents initially urged me to not talk about it. Mm -hmm. Or when other families learned, um, they were like, this is going to hurt her getting married. That's the main goal, right? And so this yeah. was from some. Yeah. Right? These yeah. were from some. That's a more traditional. Right. And I mean, overall, like capitalism and patriarchy sets us up for this, mm -hmm. sets us up for this. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just from them. I mean, even at my workplace, I mean, there was distrust in certain instances around you're working from home. Mm -hmm. Are you actually working? So overall, the stigmat stigmatizing component exists very uh, comprehensively mm -hmm. in small microaggressions. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly felt more lost in my own community because mm -hmm. I did not know other Bangladeshi young people mm -hmm. or other Muslim people um, talking about and amplifying the issues of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I grew up knowing care as a, a huge component of my faith mm -hmm. and being hospitable and sharing food and giving food. I mean, my, my home is a community center. Mm -hmm. We've treated my home as open policy for all my friends. I mean, it's a, it's a community center because we live a life based on values of, of faith mm -hmm. and, and to model the values of our prophet who, who lived by example. And so I had seen all of this, but it seemed like after I got diagnosed, some of these components of care were now oh, no, we can't talk about, well, we're, we'll care for you, but we can't talk about. We can't talk about it. These, we can care for you, mm -hmm. but don't share what you're going through. Right. Yeah, right. that's difficult. Um, but initially, in my family, the immediate thought process for me was, where are the stories mm -hmm. of, of resistance, of young Bangladeshi women mm -hmm. um, fighting for their rights and fighting for sanctuary, mm -hmm. which is why it was critical for me to write and writing now on on my Instagram, I, I with the hashtag, um, the sick wait, mm -hmm. um, chronicle my doctor's appointments and and I'm talking also about being a candidate with disability and these are important because what I've seen as a result of my launch were people with disabilities, people with chronic illnesses, reach out with hope. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we did not have hope, but we, we almost dismiss what we can strive for or dream about in terms of our own career trajectory. So I've had countless women with lupus who are like, I have not allowed myself to dream of doing this, this, and this job mm -hmm. because 
of my condition mm -hmm. or of my perceived disabilities like in the future, like what might happen in the future. And that has empowered me, that has powered me up in a way where I feel like I have to do this regardless, I, right now like regardless of how hard it becomes because it's going to pick up and it's going to be hard. Um, I've heard from many young people who are advocates, who are disability rights ad advocates and allies, mm -hmm. um, making sure that they are there to support me. Because in my, in my candidacy plan, I have a wellness plan mm -hmm. for me. <laughs> um, and, and for everyone and else. And for everyone else. Yeah, yeah. And right now, everyone who's on my team, as we push and push and thoughtfully push out our campaign, our policy platforms, um, there is a, 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 a wellness plan folder mm -hmm. to make sure that when I begin canvassing, because both of my hips are replaced and I have not yet done procedures on my ankles or knees mm -hmm. and the right shoulder, uh, which are future in, in line for the future, um, that I will struggle mm -hmm. walking door to door. Um, and I'm in a district where there's slopes. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm riding a bike, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be using a scooter, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be taking breaks, and I'm gonna be honest about my narrative. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is critical to be honest about the candidate I am, the person I am, mm -hmm. um, as a candidate running in this district. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I think that's a great story. And I mean, it's, what I said once in an article I wrote about my son, being born premature is that if I had a magic wand and I could fix it, I wouldn't hesitate. But I wouldn't want to lose the person I became. It made me a deeper, right. uh, stronger person. And I think the same thing with you. You'd rather not have had this experience. But it has also, I think I could see it's it's made you a, a more substantial person. I didn't know you before. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You can't, can't but help you grow. You know what I mean? Tremendously. So, yeah. Tremendously. Yeah. Well, thank you so thank much. You so thank much. you so much. Thank um, you so much. So we've, this has been a great interview with Shahana Hanif. She's running for city council in District 39. She made a very passionate case for her candidacy. Um, you know, and I I'm not telling you who to vote for, I'm not telling you who I'm voting for, but I think she makes a really strong case and I'm really happy to see her running for this office and I hope she can make a difference and I hope we can make a difference. So tune in to Ability Fierce. We're here every week, Sunday night, eight o'clock, Brooklyn Free Speech TV, Channel 3. <laughs>